good afternoon to everyone who are present today and who is on screen. Unfortunately, uh, it's a special occasion for me to go offline in Sweden, but not to be offline with you. But at least I hope that spring will come and everything will be all right. Um, so greetings from Ukraine. And I would like to start from uh, thanks to Sweden on the help which we receive now in Ukraine. And it's really helping. And uh, just as Michael mentioned, I'm now based in a village in between, in Kyiv region, in between Bucha and Borodanka. Maybe you heard about those uh, cities. So we'll just share, uh, starting from personal stories, then more about background on peace building and what we're doing in the field, and more on other personal stories, because I believe that it's a better possibility to learn what's going on now. Just a moment to share my screen. I hope that you can see. Hello, it. hello. Yeah, so uh, let me start from very beginning. And I would say that very beginning for Ukraine now started in 2013, even before uh, yes. beginning of the war, and back to 2013. So that's uh, me standing on a Maidan. It's quite well known square in Kyiv. And it's written uh, on behind on a wall that God is with us. Uh, during the protests on Maidan. So everyone, uh, ever since started, I would say, from that period of time, and especially for religious organizations, because it was a special occasion in order to think about the role of society and where is your place now. And uh, after all revolution period of time in uh, independence time of Ukraine, uh, there was a special <laughs> chance to change everything. Uh, but, uh, of course, then we've got much more details and much more conflict and war and full-scale war now. And you can see here now pictures from Balkans and especially from Bosnia and Sarajevo. And why do I put it here? Because in 2015, I started my peace building education in Mirovna Academy in Sarajevo uh, because we've got already a war on the east of Ukraine and in, uh, annexation of Crimean Peninsula. And I've got a lot of questions. What should we do? Because I was journalist before and on Maidan events, but I said that it's not enough. I lack some skills and understanding what should be done. And actually that those photos, uh, when I saw in a museum of Srebrenica in Sarajevo, and also those military souvenirs on the market of Sarajevo. And I was thinking like how it's possible to make industry on war and to get souvenirs like pen from the bullet or some plan made of bullets, how it's possible to get all those photos is still not to resolve the conflict if even after 20 years of its end. And then now you can see something similar in Ukraine after full scale invasion. So uh, in that Mirovna Academia, I'm really thankful for this interreligious initiative because we've got tutors from Islamic uh, perspective and from Christian perspective. And I've got some sense what can be done and that peace is possible and peace is possible during the war too. And at least I get some motivation understanding what could be done in Ukraine. Uh, so here you can see some uh, photos from the last spring because um, just a little bit about personal background. So I spent a lot of time on the front line in Ukraine since 2014. And the only one motivation of being a sociologist is to be there present and to get uh, inside observation and to feel, not to get another information from the other hands, but to see what's going on. So I worked a lot in Donetsk, Lugansk region, also was in so-called zero zone when you've got this border, which is changing every day and the battlefield, just to see what's going on. And last year, I've got another experience of occupation and staying two weeks in the siege. And here you can see some photos from the period of time. Uh, so that's occupation period when you just lay down on the floor for the whole days without food. And you just think that something can change because we didn't believe till the last period of time that it's possible to get full scale invasion. And we thought like, it's not logical. Why should we get it? But still we've got it now. And there are some, um, images of neighborhood around because there are a lot of ruins uh, still now, but still we're rebuilding. 
And another one small symbol of hope because it's Orthodox service in our territorial community. And it was the first one a week before Easter 2022, when all those people who stayed in occupation, they finally got together. And the most symbolical part was to see each other physically and not to stay at home, fight, uh, frightening about their life. So they all sitting, staying in a circle. And it was first symbol that it's possible to do something and to overcome and to cope with what we've got. But I would like to share more personal stories as soon as we are in Women's Day today. And Ukraine is, I would say, in transition of Soviet style of celebration, like a day of beauty, to the day of uh, women's rights. So all those people you can see on the background, they are my friends. So the first one is an um, IT specialist, web designer, and she's... Um, sitting on a shelter in Kyiv, she's pregnant, and she decided to stay in Kyiv because it was more safe than travel outside Kyiv. Everything is fine with her, but like, and it's not a symbol of uh, business, I would say, uh, representatives, because IT is one of the biggest infrastructure business in Ukraine now, that even those of those pictures of war is it's nothing like soldiers or some special people that but ordinary guys from every sphere another one in the middle is it's uh, olesa she was a journalist before and on february 24th she decided to serve in the army she's 45 if i'm not mistaken and sorry olesa for naming your age but also she decided to serve just an ordinary soldier she didn't know how to shoot. She didn't know how to run, how to do everything. But that was her personal decision. And that's another symbol that it's possible now to make those steps in Ukraine and also to be on the same page with men serving. Because I've just checked in the morning, we've got 40,000 women now serving in Ukrainian army. And 5,000 of them are really shooting and serving on a battlefield in a zone of conflict. And the third one, that's my colleague with whom we're working, I would say more about our dialogue connection initiative. That's Olena, she's from Kharkiv. That's um, another capital of Eastern Ukraine, we call it. It's university city. And she's a mother of the soldier and also she's a psychologist. She, so she got a lot of personal coping dilemmas and a lot of troubles she need to overcome right now, but still she's working in peace building and with people because it's another way of doing something. And I would say that the main strategy of Ukrainians today, and Ukrainian women especially, is to find your special place, to be honest with your decision. If you like to travel abroad to be safe, that's okay. If you want, uh, want to travel and will stay in Ukraine, that's okay too. So you just need to be honest with yourself and to understand what do you want to do. So uh, my decision was in 2015 that I switched finally from journalism to more in, in combination of academia and field practice of peace building, because peace building for me, it's not like a one discipline, but it's about art, because you need to be flexible, you need to be creative and to do something. And also that's a combination of realism and critical thinking with moral imagination, because why I'm working in this methodology of conflict transformation, because it was developed by John Paul Lederach, who is Mennonite, who worked a lot since 80s in peace building in different countries. And his last book is on moral imagination. So one of the biggest tasks during the war, and especially after war ends, to get any kind of moral understanding on what's going on, and also moral understanding how we should overcome war obstacles, how we can live and to find senses after it. And we also know we're using the theoretical frame of adaptive peace building, because before it was liberal theory of peace, of those Western democracy coming to other countries and helping them to rebuild. But as we can see in different examples, it's not working as it should be. So we now got a paradigm shift to adaptive peace building. So it's nothing 
like you've got concrete answers right now, but you need to be flexible and to be critical and also in the frames of conflict sensitive analysis on what's going on on the ground and not possibly to impose Western capital system, but to get some stability and to empower local representatives who knows the context and who knows what to do for their future and who get this possibility to build their vision of the future. And that's also another perspective that Ukrainian war right now, it's not like other conflicts which we had in peace building theory before, because it's not intrastate conflict, but interstate. And also another world parts are involved in it. And we've got a lot of impact on economic level, on social level, in law system, because right now it's also an issue of international law system and how does it work in a lot of dilemmas, how we should vote in UN, in uh, how OEC is working and why it's not working, and etc. And of course, there are two focuses right now. Uh, how do we act through the war right now in the active phase of conflict and how we should proceed with post-war inclusive recovery and we should think about it even now. And uh, talking about in the language of diplomacy, it's about multi-track approach. If we're taking this pyramid of three tracks of diplomacy, it's, uh, third one is about grassroots, second about civil society leaders, and the first one about state and the scope of decision makers. So we need to uh, go through those tracks and also to use as uh, Lederach, uh, in moral imagination book web approach to enforce those local uh, networks of cooperation and to be resilient enough and to create our own senses and frames of future actions. And that's also the reason why we are working a lot with religious leaders on the ground, because there are those representatives who are making senses by themselves. A little bit about the structure of peace building, because sometimes when we call it peace building, not everyone understands what do we mean by that in our COPE, it's its community of practice in Ukraine. Because right now we're in a strange situation that uh, some internationals come in and trying to impose some system of peace building, but we still got it. And we've got it since the beginning of 2000s because we've got our mediation system, dialogue facilitation system, and et cetera, and special law national for that. So we've got several areas of inter intervention which you can see. Emergency response for sure and humanitarian aid then joint sense making and policy recommendations because we co cooperate not only with our government but with EU representatives and other embassies and knowledge production because it's really important to reflect what are you doing, how do you do it and just to share with others in order to exchange experience. And of course, this infrastructure need to improve and to be in constant uh, contact, not only with society and grassroots, and with those stakeholders of the war. But definitely the hardest things we've got in peace building, there's our dilemmas. And why do I put here this strange icon? It's called, it's like an icon of Vision Mary of Mariupol with those rockets from Russia, uh, because um, in the religious field and while we're working with them, we see religious leaders on the ground as social actors who get enough resources to make the census, to connect with different people, to get engaged with social groups. And also they get this second layer of the pyramid of Treyax and they get connection with top decision makers. They get connection with grassroots and they know how to explain because of theology. But still, there is a problem with theology during the war because we've got plenty of existential questions. Why do we have war? Why God permits this war to get uh, to be there? Why uh, some of my relatives and friends are killed and etc. So of course, we've got levels like local, regional, national, international of dilemmas and layers of different spheres. And we still got a lot of discussions inside religious communities of Ukraine 
And just to remind a little bit that Ukraine is really multi-religious. It's not only about Orthodox a majority, but also Catholic, Greek Catholic, Protestant, Muslim, Jewish, and Eastern religions. We've got all of them. Uh, and what helps them is to keep the contacts inside those networks of cooperation and also abroad, because a lot of monasteries, uh, summer camps from different religious communities are used for humanitarian aid now. What is lacking is that's national understanding of war. How do we put this in overall narrative and also in the frames of religious footage? And how do we see war as an, I don't know, competition or because we're sinners? How do we explain why do we got it? What's the place for the church during the war? And we also need theological clarification on everyday basis. What do we've got now? We've got several developments on theology of war. We've got really small attempts to understand what does it mean theology of peace and also peace that could be done during the war inside the country. Because in order to prevent polarization and also understanding church as uh, agent that provides peace and that's uh, peace building as a mission of the church. That's the kind of discussions we've got inside. And of course, it's about international representation of joint and individual position of religious leaders because they invited to clarify what's going on in places and they need to put it in some frames. What are we doing here? And who are those people on the photos? In 2016, as soon as I'm sociologist, we understood that it's not enough to uh, get theological background in seminaries and to see how secular and religious organizations are working in parallel because they were responding to ongoing war, mainly on the east of Ukraine. And we decided that we need somehow to be connectors for those people from secular background and from religious background. So we organized dialogue school on the different stages on peace building, on restorative practices, on adult learning for religious, interreligious, and secular representatives. Where you can see those men standing each to each other as they actually play in a game, you can see there are Greek Catholics, Roman Catholics, Orthodox Church of Ukraine, and different Protestant ministers, and they are all military chaplains. And it was a special occasion for us to work with them because military chaplains are those who are staying on the front line and they get this dilemmas and existential questions on everyday basis. They need to respond somehow. They need to respond in crisis and they understand the value of peace because they know how it's to lose someone. So we started our theological explanations of war in terms of conflict transformation theories on those educational seminars. And then we were reflecting it in research background in academia and sharing with other theologians. But typically we've got interreligious and secular groups based on territorial communities of Ukraine. As soon as we are in the middle of uh, decentralization reform and we've got really self-organized cities and villages who are ready to decide by themselves what do they want. So we've connected those people. And one of the examples in the very beginning was that secular people finally got personal connection with uh, religious leaders. And for example, they said, for the first time I see Muslim and how they're eating, how they're praying, and we can find some personal connections. And actually, uh, the main purpose of this education was not only about teaching, peace building, but also uh, getting personal connections on the ground, uh, teaching them to cooperate, and also to understand how it's possible to form a vision of peace building in Ukraine, meaning how do we want to live and to live together as soon as we're a multi-ethnic, multi-religious society. And uh, one of the last that we've got in February was Fireplace, you can see. Uh, we've done it offline specifically just to meet each other physically. And we used fire also because uh, of different trauma-related techniques. 
we're using fire and we can come uh, each other and to see each other uh, to the fireplace and it's possible to share stories because it's really important just to talk about what we have seen uh, and how it's possible to overcome those um, contexts we've got right now. Uh, vision in the future, as I said, is the main dilemma for today because you just need to resolve everyday crises, electricity, gasoline, goods, products, and etc. And you don't think in strategic way, but there should be some people, and especially in Ukraine and not those who are coming abroad, who are forming this vision. And actually, you can see this why I put this photo as those flowers, and each flower it's a hole of the bullet because this house was shot during uh, last spring. And they decided they, they want to cope and to still to save these memories. So they painted flowers on each hole. So it's one of the symbols. How can we transform this tra tragedy experience and how to live after that? still documenting and commemorating what we've got. So our main message, which we've got now in our organization, the peace is possible. And uh, we shouldn't not talk about peace during the war, seeing that's like a traitor narrative. We should understand what kind of peace do we want? Ukraine is not Russia, that's okay. But what is Ukraine? If we don't get Russia on a border, how we would like to see each other? What does it mean to be Ukrainian today? Not only like brave people, but how do we form our new identity and how it's possible to find those pillars of support and some identity-based existential questions. And also, of course, uh, there should be different levels of visioning, personal, local, national, international. And one of the big uh, dilemmas that's for the transitional justice because uh, we've got international criminal court, we've got possibly some international tribunal, but they are not taking all the cases. The main system would be national law and national court system, a lot of cases and documenting war crimes. And to be honest, that we've got war crimes from both sides, not only from Russian side. And it's one of the hardest tasks for us to understand and to be conscious that not every Ukrainian is a hero. And of course, it's hard uh, to receive some, and to accept sometimes. And also, if we're talking about international perspective, so what should be the renewal of world system of human rights? And where should be our place in that world system? And how we can teach each other and learn from each other about guarantees of safety? guarantees of security and freedom. And now, uh, what we, do we see right now? And we are working with uh, churches mainly in revision and mission role and approach of their work because they are those who are ready to form the census, not the, like secular society. We're just uh, trying to resolve the crisis. So uh, what do we see? That church can be taken role of mission of as a part of civil society, not separated somewhere in a private sphere. Also developing collective identity and teaching again how it's to be together, but not separated from each other and to get not only individual, but community decisions and uh, be responsible for this implementation of decisions. And of course, paying special attention to adaptive peace building as a new approach of revisioning what are you doing and what conclusions do you got and impacts on society. And what next? Here you can see our latest group. And here we've got Christian, Muslims, and non-religious representatives. And we just hope to get this network of change makers in different communities of Ukraine and also to establish educational program when it would be possible to get some skills on critical thinking for sure, sense making, but also on proposing something new to theology and also proposing something new in social theory and understanding of the conflict. And of course, it's peace building as a process, ongoing process that can be lost not even for 10 or 20 years, 
but for 100 years after the end of the war. So thank you for your attention.